into shelter and solidarity, a deep dive with artists and activists during this COVID pandemic. I'm your host, Joe Ramsey, Zooming with you, Facebook live streaming with you, and eventually broadcasting on YouTube with you from Dorchester, Massachusetts, here on the south side of Boston, now over or approaching five months into this shelter in place. Today on Shelter and Solidarity, we throw you a bit of a curveball. Um, we had promoted this show as a conversation between Avi Chomsky and Greg Grandin to discuss issues of border and imperialism. Today, we are keeping our focus on empire, but shifting due to the recent tropical storm, our communications with Greg Grandin, our Zoom ability to Zoom with him has been interrupted. However, we are still fortunate to have Avi Chomsky with us today. And with some last minute organizing, we were able to seize the moment and present for you, I think a very powerful, even more timely show perhaps than we had originally planned. Our theme for today is 75 years after Hiroshima, reflecting on the world that nuclear weapons and U.S. empire have made. We'll be joined by Avi and a couple of great speaker scholar activists that we will introduce in a moment. But first, I just want to welcome Avi back to the show. This is at least your second time here on Shelter and Solidarity, and we're really glad to have you, Avi. Uh, make sure to unmute yourself so we can hear and see you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's great to be here. Avi, our last show with you uh, addressing issues of immigrant justice struggles, I highly recommend to people. It was one of our first shows, and it's really great to have you back here for a topic uh, that, is, that is as pressing as ever. Um, Avi, it was really, um, well, we do look forward to having you and Greg back, though, perhaps in a, in a month or two, we can get you back on on a Thursday that works for both of you. I hope so. Great. So our topic for today takes off from the poignant commemoration. I hesitate to call it an anniversary today as this is we record on August 6th. August 6th, 2020 represents the 75th anniversary commemoration of the dropping of the first nuclear bomb on people by the United States government on August 6th, 1945, specifically the people in the city of Hiroshima followed by a second bomb dropped by the United States military on the city of Nagasaki on August 9th. Those two atomic bombs alone killed over 200,000 people and the implications of, that, of those weapons and their existence and the escalation of those tools of destruction are still very much with us. Here on this show, we have talked a lot over the last approaching 20 weeks of programming now on issues that threaten humanity. The COVID crisis, the pandemic has made us very acutely aware of the way in which even the continuation of human life as we know it is a contingent fact can, that can be threatened by unknown diseases. We've also talked about the way in which the financial crisis itself, the economic crisis and other things that have been triggered by COVID threaten our livelihoods threaten our ability to carry on life as quote unquote normal. In addition, we've had discussion on this show of climate change and global warming, which represents a long-term and increasingly acute and present existential threat to humanity as such. One theme we have not yet addressed on this show, but which we will be diving into today is another pressing existential threat that faces hum humanity as we go into the 20th 21st century, and that is the threat of nuclear war, the threat of nuclear weapons, and the particular threats created by U.S. empire and U.S. imperialism, including but not limited to the threat of nuclear weapons. On that note, we have with us today a group of powerful speakers, uh, writers, activists who focus on issues of atomic weapons, Hiroshima in particular, and the broader question of U.S. empire and resistance to that empire. I'm very, very pleased to join, uh, to be joined today by, to start with, Garl, Gar, Gar Alperowitz, who is one of the leading scholars on the question of why the bomb was in fact dropped on Hiroshima in the first place. Gar, are you there? Make sure to unmute yourself, Gar, so we can hear and see you. As soon as I unmute, here I am, yes. Good to see you, Joe. 
Great, Gar. It's great to, great to meet you. I've been uh, following your work for years on a variety of fronts. Um, Gar, uh, I would like to start by asking you to, if you could share a few thoughts on what this 75th anniversary of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima uh, represents for you. What do you think are the most uh, important uh, things to call up in this, in this obviously historic moment 75 years since the dropping of the bomb at 8.15 a.m. over the city and on the people, the civilian population of Hiroshima. Uh, Gar, I would just like to, we'll get into uh, some specific questions in a bit, but I'd like you to just ask right now to just uh, speak to your, your overall reflections on this, on this August 6th date. Well, the, uh, I've been thinking about writing about this for more than 50 years now. <clears throat> and the issue, we can go into great depth about why it was done, and there's no doubt uh, that it was unnecessary and known to be unnecessary. And indeed, virtually all the conservative generals and admirals came out publicly saying they hadn't been taught to kill women and children. We can go into that, inf that information as well. But the real story of Hiroshima is how irresponsible leadership can be in the use of nuclear weapons. And we're looking forward. I think Hiroshima is as much about the future as the past. We're looking forward at, at the building of more and more weapons that they have not yet gone off. And when they go off, it's not only that people will be destroyed who are underneath the bombs, but the, the dust and debris thrown up into the atmosphere will create a nuclear winter, which will have implications for, hot, for hunger and famine around the world. We have been extremely lucky for 75 years that these haven't gone off. And the decision-making you see in the White House now the possibility that some other leader in some place in the world will go off. It's time for a renewed interest in arms control and radical disarmament to get control of these weapons. So I think that the story of Hiroshima is looking, from my point of view, and we can go into what we now know about the decision making, which is a, a pretty un, 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 uh, unpleasant story. But decision makers who in future, and look who's occupying the White House now, who might actually lead us into uh, very great danger, both nuclear danger, but danger of nuclear winter as well. I really appreciate that, Gar, that this is not just a historical question, not just a question of remembering the past, but of orienting towards the future. We'll get to that future and that present soon, but I would ask you to help orient folks who have not followed this as closely as you have over the last, as you point out, 50 years. If you could take us back to your research you know, you, you have uh, published a, a really, really powerful book on this topic. I mean, an 800-page tome, really, right, uh, on this topic of why the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And we encourage people to check out that work. Could you unpack for us a little bit, I mean, and maybe deconstruct a bit the, the narrative that so many of us have heard, right? Well, let me do that. Uh... It was when you were in school. Yeah, well, just even briefly, uh, the essence the of the, version. The, yeah, the, the short version of like well, the story we most of us have been told, right? Uh, or we're told at some point, perhaps in school, perhaps through media, by politicians, is that, you know, however regrettable and, and, and deadly, um, the, the bomb was necessary for the war, war effort. And ultimately, it was even a humanitarian decision to drop the bomb because a land invasion of Japan would have cost more, um, certainly more American lives and maybe even more Japanese lives than the bombs themselves uh, took. Um, I have a detailed critique of that. I'd love to hear just the, the basics of it. And then a sense, Gar, of what is your understanding of why that bomb in fact was dropped uh, by the United States? Sure, let me, let me start by saying uh, the book wasn't quite that long, but it was really two books because the story, uh, the brief, brief picture that you've asked me to give out, uh, lay out why it was used and what we now know. We know a lot now, but, there was enormous criticism of the bomb almost immediately after the war, including major conservative military leaders. President Eisenhower is on record publicly as attacking the decision. You can find conservative admirals, generals, they're all critics of the use of the atomic bomb as totally unnecessary. As the, one of the chief admirals who was chief of staff to the president, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, simultaneously chairman of the US-UK Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Leahy was his name. Truman's, it was like, it, it was sort of like uh, uh, Vice President uh, Cheney whispering in the ear of George Bush, but he controlled the decision. Uh, 
Eisenhower said it, I, we should never have used this terrible thing. Uh, virtually all of the admirals and generals, conservatives came out saying what we're going to, what I'm going to talk about tonight. It was totally unnecessary and known to be unnecessary. So here's a case where rarely you have all the, all the military uh, conservatives on your side in that period. So that's the framework. So the book is two books, how they then convinced the public with a massive public relations campaign, contrary to the military view, that the bomb had to be used. Um, what we know about the decision is that a good deal of the time, they'd broken the Japanese codes. They were reading everything that the Japanese foreign minister was saying to the ambassador in Russia trying to get a negotiated settlement. They knew the war was essentially over and that the bomb was unnecessary. What we know, however, is that the bomb was deeply involved in calculations about how it would, how it would, what it could do with the Russians in negotiations over both Europe and the Far East. We were at the Potsdam Conference, and that was the settlement of Germany in Eastern Europe. And as Truman said I, about, about the Russians, I'll certainly have a hammer on those boys when this bomb goes off. Uh, the Secretary of War called it the MasterCard of his diplomacy towards the Russians in 1945. And there's a lot of information, if we have, we'll have time to go into it, if we have you know, lots of other things to talk about tonight. But that whole picture of how it played a role in diplomacy and how the US thought about the post-war world and particularly what you could do with the Soviet Union. The other piece of that is we had, before the bomb was tested, which was, it was tested in July 16th, in April of 1945, and indeed at the Yalta conference before that, January and February, we had asked the Russians, asked Stalin to bring the Red Army into the war in the Far East. And the reason was the bomb was just a theory and we wanted their help to control and to enter Japan and pin down the Japanese armies in Manchuria and maybe even go into an invasion. They had agreed to come in three months after the German war ended and watch these dates very closely. The war ended in Germany May 8th. The Russian army was set to attack on August 8th, three months later. The bomb was used on August 6th at Hiroshima and August 9th at Nagasaki. Those dates are not an accident. There was a tremendous rush at the end once the bomb was successfully tested, July 16th. That's the first time they knew the bomb actually worked. There was a tremendous rush to use it before the Red Army got into Manchuria explicitly. They saw it as Truman called it a master card of diplomacy towards the Russians. There's also other lots of, lots of uh, Truman call it, called it a hammer on those boys, the Russians. Secretary of War Stimson called it a master card. Secretary of State Burns wanted to use the bomb explicitly in order to end the war before the Red Army got very far into Manchuria. So the whole story at the end is they knew the war was coming to an end. There could not be an invasion. The big invasion couldn't happen until 1946. There wasn't much fighting going on at all. The first landing could not occur till November, three months off, but they rushed to use the bomb, particularly because the Russians were about to come in on August 8th, three months as, it, as planned, and the bomb was used on August 6th. So there's a long story about it, but they were fully aware that the Japanese were trying to surrender because we'd broken all the codes and it was unnecessary of bombing and taking out a, you know, 200,000 people. Mostly, one other last point and I'll stop. To Hiroshima was not a military target. There was a small installation there. So what did that mean? The young men were off to war. There were some industrial workers, but largely women. So who was left behind? Women, children, and old people. That's the largest part of the population who were destroyed in Hiroshima with the young guys off to war. So it's a very, uh, it's a very ugly story. And as I said, the people who understood that most of all were some of these old conservative generals and admirals who came out almost immediately after World War II saying, this is outrageous. I wasn't taught to kill women and children. And then there's a whole list of them, right? The top US brass was denounced Hiroshima just after the war. So that's the broad framing of it. I'm sure we can go into a lot of details, but the real issue, I think, and let me say one last word about the future. I think the story is about irresponsible decision-making, the danger of nuclear weapons, and how we organize in the future to begin getting control of these things before one of them goes off in, in anger again. That's really the issue. That, that's, that's our question in this generation looking forward rather than simply the historical fact.
Absolutely, Gar, and uh, thank you for for uh, framing that history. And and I we will, in light of that history, dive into the implications in the present as this show progresses. Avi, I'd like to bring you in at this point to reflect as well on this 75th commemoration today as someone who works on empire and is very in, in tune and in touch with people struggling and studying about and against US imperialism around the world. Um, I know you have a global view and you've actually helped us to, to, to organize today's show at the last minute to really drawing on some of those connections and we'll bring in one of your, your, your scholar uh, activist uh, contacts in a moment. But Avi, I'd like to ask you first, responding perhaps to what Gara said, or also in your own way, to what this 75th uh, Hiroshima anniversary uh, means for you, and, and what do you think it should mean for us? So I would say that I approach it as a history professor teaching kind of mainstream students at a public university in Massachusetts. Um, who come in with a very triumphalist, triumphalist view of World War II and exactly the view that Gar was just critiquing of how, oh yes, we had to drop the bomb because it saved lives and we did such a great thing. Um, but what I really think about is not just how misinformed students are about history, because of course they're misinformed about everything about history, but how this specific misinformation shapes the way they see US empire in the present, because the vision of the United States as a benevolent power in the world going around saving everybody um, and the complete obliviousness to US empire and its nature and what it means and the human suffering involved with it today um, are just astonishing to me. And, you know, I grew up during the Vietnam War. I guess I could say I came to political consciousness during the Central American Wars. Um, and the existence of a large peace movement opposing U.S. interventions abroad um, was part of my childhood and my coming to consciousness young adulthood. Um, and one of the things that's just shocking to me now is the lack of an active peace movement among young people um, and a lack of awareness of U.S. militarism and colonialism and war that's going on now. And I think that um, that the way they are taught and agree to understand um, Hiroshima is, is a big part of how they come to interact with empire today. Yeah, that's a powerful point, Avi. I mean, I, I think the, the point you make, I mean, if dominant history and ideology posing as history can get people to accept the idea that even dropping a nuclear bomb on a predominantly civilian population can be worth it, right? Can be ultimately a way of saving lives. Then it does seem like the, the ideological path for getting people to accept perhaps any level of violence against any people, right? It, for the so-called good, right, of the future, right? Whether for progress, for, for even the, even the hum, you know, hum, humanitarian reasons, right? It seems that that path seems cleared. So, I mean, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but I think that's a very profound way to tie that history to the present. Um, and also this issue of the left, even people on the left, let alone just general public and, and the, 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 the barriers to internationalism, right? The, the way in which even as we feel like the United States public, maybe some parts of it moving left or less closed off to socialism, the idea, some of these ideas that Bernie Sanders campaign represented, for instance, there is also, I think, a, a, a real concern you're raising that even when we do see a kind of progressive, more anti-racism in the streets, the question of, of, of what that means or to what degree that's being translated into an international global vision that actually takes on war, empire, the bases that make all these wars and, and, and imperial actions possible, doesn't seem to come up as much as, as maybe it used to or maybe as much as it should. Um, I mean, do you, could you elaborate a little bit more on that or where you see um, the dangers of that, even on the left itself, even among activist communities or new activist groups? And, and what do you see as possible um, you know, remedies for that or exceptions to that rule? Um, I mean, I guess part of the danger is what we could call the corporate takeover of diversity. Um, 
the uh, the narrowing of the discussion of racism and racial violence and racial injustice to a sort of uh, um, uh, affirmative action language that as long as we allow a few people of color to rise, we've solved the problem. Um, and that's what I mean by the affirmative action. Um, but today it would be called a diversity and inclusion. Um, but who are we talking about including? We're talking about um, basically uh, keeping a system and a social structure uh, just as they are, but allowing a few people of color to rise to positions of power within that system and structure. Um, so I think that is the greatest danger of the anti-racist movements today being co-opted into a kind of a uh, neoliberal corporate uh, diversity uh, language and initiatives. Yeah. Avi, I'd like to w welcome you to actually play a bit of a co-host role with me today, uh, as you are now a veteran of this show, having survived your first encounter brilliantly. Um, and I'd like to invite you to, to introduce our next uh, guest, who's been waiting patiently, and I know has much to say. Not only, uh, not you know, perhaps about this this moment today we're we're remembering, but also about the broader issues of empire uh, and imperialism that that this day raises. Could you actually? Introduce our, our next guest, and then we will we will bring in our, our final guest after that. Avi, I would be very happy to. Um, so, when you suggested the new topic for today's um, today's forum, the first person who came to mind was Marie Cruz Soto, um, and I thought it would be thrilling if I could reach her quickly enough and, and get her to come on tonight. And what do you know, it worked. So, um, Marie teaches at NYU, and her research focuses. On, and I actually can't remember what department you're in at NYU, so you're going to have to tell us that when you come on. Um, but her research works on anti-colonial um, movements against mil U.S. militarized colonialism, um, especially in the form of military bases, uh, both in Vieques, Puerto Rico, um, and in Oki Okinawa, Japan. So we, we see the, the long role of, that Japan has played in US empire um, after World War II in Southeast Asia, um, and in particular, the role of Okinawa, which I was actually lucky enough to visit just a couple of months ago and meet with some anti-base activists there. So uh, that was an exciting overlap and connection with Marie's work. But, um, but her work begins in Puerto Rico um, with movements against militarized colonialism and violent displacement and dispossession and seeing bases as U.S. military bases around the world as part of the U.S. colonial project. So, um, so did you want to frame the question yeah, to well, Marie? Sure. Yeah, Marie, thank you. First off, just thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. And it's nice to see you. Can I hear you as well? You got your you're unmuted, I hope. Thank you for the invitation. Glad okay, great. And uh, it's it's really great to see uh, comrades and, and fellow scholar activists in action when there is a bit of an emergency and to see how we can make um, a virtue of, of a kind of emergency in this way. Uh, so thank you again for being here. Marie, I would just ask you to s start with just a, a reflection that you may have on this moment that we are in this specific day uh, of the, you know, August 6, 2020, the 75th anniversary of the U.S dropping the bomb on Hiroshima, but if you would like to take it more generally, not only in terms, I mean, what is, you know, what do you think we need to be thinking about at this moment of history as we remember this anniversary, but also as we confront the, the contemporary situation uh, from our particular vantage points? I mean, what stands out to you about this, this moment that we need to reflect on? Um, well, again, thank you, um, Joe, and thank you, Abby, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be part of the conversation. Um, I'm at the Galatine School of Individualized Study at NYU. And I also wanna say that my internet is doing all sorts of crazy things. Like I can't participate in the chat apparently. So just to let everyone know. Um, so I'm thinking about um, the, sort of the question that you posed earlier, Joe, about how is it that um, it, you know, the dropping of the bomb it has been framed in the U.S. in a very convincing way um, as an issue of saving lives, right? And I think that goes to me at the heart of the issue. Um, saving lives, 
how does that question actually make invisible? The issue of, it's not about saving lives, it's about who's left. But part of, part of what I think we should be thinking about is whose lives are we talking about, right? It's a historical debate about saving lives, but it's, it's saving whose life, right? It's definitely not saving Japanese lives, right? And I would say that when we're thinking about US empire and militarism, there's a way in which it, I think within the US, there's a comfort that people feel that they should not feel. Like, if they don't think about the US as an empire. They don't think that militarism affects them in a direct way. They think that it's sort of in the outside, a dangerous outside that has to be dealt with, that is threatening dangers. But when we're thinking about things like the dropping of a bomb, think about thinking about all the things that had to, to happen for the dropping of the bomb, whose lives were affected within the domestic, domestic sphere, right? All the lives that were thinking about um, what Abby was saying about the human sufferings, like what spaces were impacted, what communities, what vulnerable communities had to be dispossessed for the military to take over, to create bases, to create testing sites, what people um, got affected by different sorts of diseases for the consequences of this kind of practices, and then how these communities, vulnerable communities, predominantly poor communities of color within the domestic, and I'm including within the domestic here, Puerto Rico as well, although Puerto Rico occupies a weird relationship within the US, how militarism and the violence of the US military linked the within, the domestic, with the foreign, the outside, right? So we're not separated at all. And when we're thinking about whose lives, the, the issue is about lives, I think, indeed, but it is about questioning that idea that there are lives that were safe and more so putting the emphasis on all the lives that were impacted of all the human suffering and how that U.S. empire and U.S. militarism links people across the globe in this sort of just unleashing of world violence. Although I would also add to that that the U.S. military is not just about unleashing world violence. Thinking about the experiences of everyday life um, in places like Vieques, Okinawa, it's not just spectacular violence. It's all sorts of manifestations that degrade life, environment, landscapes, and just daily life, right? For so many people across the world, and something that is usually shared by the people who are most affected by this is that there are usually poor communities of color that are too vulnerable to voice opposition to this and to marginalized, to be heard, to be made, to be made visible, and for even you know, people within the domestic to even care really for them. And I think that may be the framing of the debate in the now that ties not so much to, you know, the, the date, but to all the protests that are going on about racial inequality and violence in the U.S. And that should be pushing people more to say we have to link the push to defund the police to defund the military. Absolutely, Marie. That's a powerful point. I was recently reading this book. I'm sure some of you have noticed and perhaps read as well, How to Hide an Empire. Uh, Daniel Im Imrewar uh, has published uh, this terrific book. I think it came out last year. And, and there's extended discussions of Puerto Rico, as well as other parts of what he calls the greater United States, right? Places that have actually that have been or in fact are still parts of the United States, which would are not, but are not, that are not officially states, Right, and are often not thought of as part of the, what he calls, I think, the, the logo map of the United States that many of us have in our heads. And one thing I learned in reading that book was that, and of course, thinking about these Black Lives Matter, these movement for Black Lives, anti-police violence, anti-racist protests that have been going on over the past few months, is learning that according to this book, the actual largest single day massacre of protesters by police actually occurred in Puerto Rico, right? Uh, you know, in, in a response to a you know, kind of a revolutionary nationalist protest. And I don't have the date in front of me, but it was something, again, we often don't think of an event like that as, and I say we, I'm sure it depends on your point of view, but I mean, it seems to me even mainstream, or at least the mainstream narrative, and even some of the activist narratives around police violence don't often, inc you know, aren't framed in such a way as that sort of police violence in these parts of the, the hidden parts of the empire actually get included. Uh, so I'm just so glad that you're, you're here today to help us to see these links between different moments and different locations within this imperialist 
history. And I'd like to, before we bring in our, our final official speaker, to ask you to say a little more about what things look like from your research, your work, and your knowledge about, on the ground in Puerto Rico. And I know you do a lot of work around in and around Vieques in particular. And if you could maybe unpack a little bit more for us, what are the ways that empire imperialism uh, manifests in the communities with which you've worked most closely? Uh, maybe I'll just say briefly that Puerto Rico is an archipelago, that Puerto Rico was basically invaded and occupied in 1898 by the U.S. Empire, and the U.S. basically stayed with um, the archipelago till the present moment, right? And Vieques is an island of the Puerto Rican archipelago that in the 1940s, um, basically three-fourths of the island were taken over for the U.S. Navy. So people were pushed, this, and the island is sort of like this shape, and people were sort of pushed into a civilian land strip in the middle, and then there was um, a weapon testing site to the east, and then um, an ammunition depot to the west. And this was the reality of the Akinsis for over 60 years until they got together. But well, they had been um, resisting this protesting, but they managed to kick the Navy out in 2003. Um, so I think your question, Joe, was about how to think about U.S. empire from, let's say, the perspective of Vieques and Puerto Rico. Is that what you're asking me? A little bit, yeah. I, th I think that would be in the spirit. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll say this. Um, empire, empires don't work, and the US, in U.S. empire in particular doesn't work, I would argue, if you don't have outright raw violence that then gets increasingly more sophisticated. And going back to, I think, um, Joe, you were mentioning the Ponce massacre, uh, whereby you know, the colonial government massacred nationalist and anti-colonial protesters, right? Um, so I think if you look at the history of Puerto Rico in the early 20th century, it's incredibly violent. And the US, just like in the Philippines, just across the world, actually, the US was such a, the US empire, such a heavy-handed use of just outright spectacular acts of violence, right? That eventually get more sophisticated and people get more, um, not accustomed, the violence is ingrained, and I think a lot of trans, trans fan on here, right? How you develop a colonized mentality, how you develop sort of, sort of an understanding that you, you're part of this empire, that you, you're getting what you deserve, and then you are subjected to that violence and you pass it along. Um, but I just want to say then that, just in a basic sense, US empire doesn't work just by persuading and giving people liberty and freedom and whatever else, which you know the empire doesn't give. It starts with just outright violence and it complements it with all sorts of carrot and sticks sort of thing, right? And then ideologically, it sort of convinces the colonized to live with this. And then in the case of Puerto Rico, it made Puerto Ricans be the people who actually do the labor of running the colonial state. So the violence gets more sophisticated and it seems like Puerto Rico then became the model colony for for the US, but it's just that process, right, of just raw outright violence becoming more sophisticated, becoming more ingrained, more hegemonic, and then you have Puerto Rico today has all sorts of problems, and people live in extreme vulnerability, as it became evident with Hurricane Maria. Maybe I'll just... Absolutely, and, and we'll, we can come back to that. Um, you've given us so much already, Maria. I, I want to make sure to bring in our, our fourth speaker, our fourth guest today, and then uh, once we have heard from all of you, to encourage you to engage with one another, as well as with me and Avi as a, as a kind of acting co-host today. And then I also wanna remind everyone who's on the live Zoom right now, and even those of you who are on Facebook, uh, we will, as usual, be opening up the discussion to you once we get to around the hour mark, give or take. Uh, and we will generally go for another 30 minutes of your questions and comments. I know these are very rich topics and we welcome your your comments. If you'd like to indicate that you want to speak, please write a note in the chat box if you can, or if you're on Facebook, you can write a chat a note uh, in the threads there, and we'll try to we'll try to get to that. Thank you, Marie. Uh, Joseph Gerson has uh, reached uh, has joined us today again. Thank you, Joe, for being here. Thank you, Joseph, for being here. Um, this last minute organizing to make this very historically appropriate show happen today on August 6, 2020. Thank you, Joe, for being here. 
I'm glad to join and uh, sorry I came in a little bit late. Great. Well, you're just in time. Uh, Joseph Gerson, for those who don't know, is a long-standing, decades-long uh, peace activist, has worked with American Friends Service Committee. And in fact, Joe, as I understand it, as you told me earlier today, if it weren't for the exceptional circumstances of this COVID uh, crisis we're dealing with all over the world, you'd most likely be in Japan, in Hiroshima, as you have been for many, many years honoring this date in, on, at Ground Zero in Hiroshima. Is that right? Yeah, you know, back in the in the mid 1980s, uh, Senator Kennedy got suckered into a, an effort to turn Boston Harbor into a nuclear weapons base, uh, and we you know, organized and we defeated that. And uh, it turned out that the weapon system that was going to be based there, the Sea Launch cruise missile, was the principal uh, weapon uh, that Reagan was using to increase U.S. nuclear nuclearization of the Pacific. And so when we won, uh, a mutual friend. I'd been in touch with the Japanese movement and I was invited, invited to come basically as a symbol that, that people can prevail. And you know, there I, I you know, was deeply moved obviously by, by the A-bomb survivors, the Hibakusha, uh, but also you know, learning about the, the, the role, the history of the US-Japan military alliance, uh, the resistance of people uh, in Okinawa, in the Philippines and other countries. And so I dug in over the years. So normally, I, I, I'm in Japan now uh, for you know, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki commemorations, international conferences. In, in Japan, it's a social movement um, for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, they, uh, the World Conference pulls together about 10,000 people. Uh, and in their efforts, in, in the A-bomb survivors and peace movement's efforts uh, to win the abolition of nuclear weapons, uh, a, a petition initiated by the A-bomb survivors as now almost 12 million uh, signatures, which they'll be presenting to the United Nations. So I just to say, I mean, it's difficult for me being in the United States right now. And, and the A-bomb survivors are people who are, are very close to me. I just a little bit of, of advertising uh, on, on, uh, on Sunday, uh, this book will be released. Uh, it's, it's the memoir of one of the most savaged uh, of the uh, victims of the A-bombing uh, who went on to help to co-found the movement of A-bomb survivors, uh, and it really was one of the world's leading uh, campaigners for nuclear weapons abolition. Thank you, Joe. Uh, is it okay if I call you Joe, or do you prefer Joseph? Sorry, I'm, you're I more of a Joseph. Jo I prefer Joseph. I left, I left you're, you behind. A you're a Joseph. Ago. Okay, sorry. I, I write my name Joseph, but I'm Joe in person, so I don't mean to project that onto you. Yeah. So, Joseph, I would like to ask you the question or give you the opportunity to reflect that all three of our other guests have had, which is just really to reflect on this, this moment, this 75th anniversary, which you would usually be, it seems, spending in Hiroshima with the directly affected and their descendants and this social movement you mentioned. What, do you, what stands out to you as the, the main kind of uh, aspects of this moment that you would like to lift up um, into our consciousness today, as we as we take stock of this 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 crucial uh, history. Well, I think I think two things. I mean, one one is that the average age now of the A bomb survivors is eighty three, uh, and so their their memories, their testimonies, um, you face the danger of, of fading into history. Uh, you know, these people who have become politically active. Uh, you know, it's been in part their, their reason for living. I mean, many of them attempted to commit suicide over the years because of their physical and, and mental uh, torture. Uh, and they've been working for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Their, their basic truth is that human beings and nuclear weapons cannot coexist. Uh, and so finding ways to honor that, uh, appreciating what, it, what a really conflicted day this is for them, both as, as the anniversaries always bring them back to really almost an immediate experience of the hell that they lived through and experienced. Uh, and on the other hand, their opportunity to be working for the abolition of nuclear weapons. So we have that on the one hand, uh, but on the other, I think we need to appreciate uh, that, uh, you know, the, the bulletin atomic scientist tells us that we're only 100 seconds uh, to midnight. Uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, who was um, uh, Colin Powell's secretary, uh, chief of staff, when Powell was secretary of defense, uh, was telling us uh, two nights ago uh, that the dangers of nuclear war are greater now than they were during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we've got the arms race going on with, with Russia. 
uh, and you know, we've got the history of, of miscalculations and accidents. Uh, and the United States and China uh, have been beginning to duke it out, especially in the South China Sea. Uh, South China Sea uh, is, is functionally the geopolitical center of the struggle for world power right now. Uh, the United States is trying to hold on to its hegemony in the region. Uh, the Chinese are trying to, to create their own Monroe Doctrine in the region. Uh, and we are, you know, there's the danger of a Thucydides trap here, uh, the, you know, the historic dangers of conflict between uh, rising and declining powers. So, and these things will all be very, 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 very present. I guess the other thing just to say, um, Marie was talking about Okinawa. Normally at, at, the, at the World Conference, you have delegates from, from Okinawa uh, who are coming to explain the latest atrocities of the U.S. military occupation there. Uh, and appealing for for Japanese solidarity, and it's a comp and the the history of Japan and Okinawa are are really quite complex. And so, Joseph, I would welcome you to say a little more about that. We actually uh, Avi was helping us to reach out to some some Japanese activists uh, as we put this show together today. But of course, uh, many of them were perhaps sleeping, so this is, we have quite a time differential here. So lacking their presence, would you, would you step into explaining a little more about um, the situation on Okinawa for those who aren't even familiar with the basics as well as what, what are some of these, uh, what, you, what you've been hearing from your, your friends and, and your, your contacts over there? Sure, I would like so can to. I just jump in before Joe? Yeah, sure, um, Abby, you people know who I was trying to fight were actually Okinawan activists, not Japanese uh, activists. Thank, thank so, you for the clarification. Yeah. Speaking thank of you. colonialism. Absolutely. And, 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 anyway. And, and welcoming, yeah, I mean, point taken. And, and Avi, also, as I've indicated to you, please welcome, you step in any time that you would like. Uh, Joseph. Okay, uh, so just, just to say, my hope is that we come back and, and talk a little bit about the U.S. efforts to regain nuclear primacy and, and what that means. Uh, but simply in terms of Okinawa, to appreciate that until the late 19th century, Okinawa was an independent Ryukyuan kingdom. Uh, it was a tributary state of China uh, but the Japanese were deeply involved, especially since about the, the 17th century. Uh, and once the United States forced Japan open with the black ships, uh, the, 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 essentially the game was over. There's no more reason for the Japanese to um, uh, kind of pretend they were playing nice with Okinawa. And, and very much like, uh, like Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, the Japanese uh, moved in and took it over. They had their own language. Uh, and their, their occupation and integration of Okinawa was done very brutally. I mean, among other things, people were forbidden to um, uh, speak the Okinawan language. Uh, and I work with, a, I work with an environmentalist, a, an opponent to the bases in Okinawa, uh, who, you know, a bit younger than me, who can remember being severely punished in school for the crime of uh, speaking, speaking Okinawan. Uh, the, the Okinawa was not militarized uh, during most of the war. Uh, but in 1944, as the U.S. forces were coming closer, the Japanese moved their, their forces uh, down there, uh, militarized it in order to ex extend the time of the war so they could buy time for what was called the emperor system. Uh, and you know, deeply fortified and especially in, uh, in, in caves. Uh, there was, as the U.S. approached the, um, uh, the invasion, it was called the um, was called the 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 the, 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 the tornado of steel, something like that. Uh, just in, in, incredibly intense. Uh, the Japanese military was brutal. Uh, it uh, forced many many of the uh, Japanese, to, rather the Okinawans, to commit suicide uh, rather than survive the battle. Uh, many Okinawans who were seeking shelter in caves where the, the military was uh, were forced out or killed. In the course of the battle, one quarter of the Okinawan people were killed. That's about 150,000 out of 600,000. And when the U.S. took over, uh, it, put, it put all the people into concentration camps, seized considerable amounts of, of land there. And as I said in the, in the chat note, um, as, I, as I, um, I had an interview with the with U.S. Consul General there a few years ago, uh, he, he, he quite clearly said, I mean, explicitly said, the whole island is a U.S. military base, uh, and it's been used for, you know, heavily used in the Korean War, heavily used in the Vietnam War, used as a jumping off point for U.S. Um, uh, wars in the Middle East. Uh, and the people there, I mean, they're, 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 
resistance has been really quite remarkable. Uh, deeply committed to nonviolence uh, and, and just absolutely steadfast. I mean, there's been an effort to build a, a major new uh, air and naval base uh, at Hinoko, um, the base basically to, to, to serve U.S. forces throughout the 21st century. Uh, and people have been having sit-ins, bringing canoes to block construction now for about 20 years. Uh, and they've been able to halt it so far and have basically created a bit of a wedge uh, between uh, U.S. And, and Japanese government relations because the government has been unable to fulfill its, its obligation. The other piece just to say here is that, you know, the history of, uh, of U.S. military crimes, uh, sexual violence, uh, accidents, uh, you know, the history is just really grim in terms of what, what U.S. troops have done uh, in Okinawa now over just about 75 years. Thank you, Joseph. Avi? So I also just wanted to mention that when I teach World War II, I try to teach it to my students as a colonial war. Mm -hmm. um, it was a war over colonies. And I ask them how the United States, I mean, they think that World War II was a war of the United States against Nazi Germany. Um, and I ask them how the United States actually got involved in World War II. And they say, well, it was when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And I say, okay, so where was Pearl Harbor? And they say, um, um, um. And then they say, oh, it was in Hawaii. And I say, and what was Hawaii in 1941? Mm -hmm. Hawaii? Hawaii? <laughs> Hawaii was a U.S. colony, mm -hmm. of course, um, and much of the war was fought over the colonies, um, the different European colonies in the Pacific, and the United States didn't join the uh, European war until the very last minute, until after the USSR had defeated Nazi Germany. So, um, so, so the war in the Pacific, um, and in particular the war in Okinawa, that is much of the U.S. war was in fact fought in Okinawa, and many of the casualties were Okinawan civilians. Um, but I wanted to ask Marie um, if she could compare a little bit um, what Joe was telling us about the history of Okinawa and Japanese and now US colonialism in Okinawa with what you've studied in Puerto Rico. And also, if you can, um, also about some of the resistance movements in Vieques and Puerto Rico. Um, well, there are incredible similarities between the two, even though the, I mean, Puerto Rico is part of the U.S. and, you know, Okinawa is supposed to be part of Japan and Japan is supposed to be an independent nation state. Um, maybe I would say that the big difference is that once the U.S. came in in 1998, it started militarizing different parts of the Puerto Rican archipelago. Um, it made bases, it displaced people, it dispossessed people, it treated people as racialized colonial others that could just be discarded, moved, then no legal process, nothing. Um, in the case of, to, to compare particularly Vieques and Okinawa, the U.S. Navy comes in into Vieques through a supposed legal process of expropriations. So it's supposed to, it's supposed to be this lawful thing that, um, took place with the approval of politicians in Washington, in San Juan. And if, you know, paper, it's supposed to have been this sort of orderly process. It really wasn't. Most people in Vegas didn't have property titles. They were poor. They, you know, in Vegas there was super colonialism, a lot of dispossession. People were basically, um, their house, the Navy basically just literally took some of the poorest parts of the population and told them, we're just gonna dump you like trash in this sort of fields without any infrastructure. And whatever you do, that's on you. We don't really care, right? So the legal process of expropriation, they really apply for, I would say the majority of the population, only for the people who were the big landowners who were the hacendados, right? In Okinawa, the process is different and sort of the same actually because the U.S. comes in to Okinawa through the Battle of Okinawa, and then all the internal displacement and the violence that the Battle of Okinawa creates, the U.S. then utilizes that um, chaos, dispossession, to then just stay. And the people who left their homes then found themselves in basically concentration camps, refugee camps, and not being allowed to go back home, right? 
And in the case of Okinawa, the U.S. doesn't really do an expropriation process because that's not their legal system. That's, you know, they assume less, in a way, at least officially, less of our responsibility with the people of Okinawa. And they just, the U.S. basically says, we're just staying here and we're going to make a base here and here and here. And so they don't even, they don't buy the land. They just take it over with sort of the permission, but it's not really even the permission of, you know, Tokyo. They just do it, right? And Tokyo at this point just sort of ascends. And uh, then it's this sort of farce of not buying the land, but paying rent for it. And then the people who are supposed to be the owners of the land that is taken over by the US just receive a nominal sum, but they have no choice about this. And then it's still sort of this ambiguous situation in which the US is the one who's really the sovereign in Okinawa. And it sort of acknowledges that it is, but it's really, a situation negotiated but not negotiated with Tokyo. And that at the end of the day, Okinawans have very, very little choice or voice or opinion about what happens to them. Um, in terms of to, to, to move, to fast forward to the present and to think more about um, anti-base, anti-militarism, pro-peace movements. To me, one of the most inspiring things about about anti-colonialism and this sort of sites that are invisible to you know people within the US for the most part is just how incredibly thoughtful and sophisticated are the analysis and of activists across the world. Places like Okinawa, um, South Korea, Vieques, is how they understand their situation, how they understand the US empire, and how they understand their connections between all the sites and the way that they come together under to be subjected by US violence, right? And I would say that in Vieques, maybe I just finish by saying this. Vieques, Vieques were basically protesting since day one, when the US Navy got there. The protesters really took, the protests sort of spiked in the 60s, really in the late 70s, 80s. And then in 1999, there's a civilian killed by a, by a bomb. And then there's a, this big civil disobedience movement that manages to kick the Navy out. And part of the way that this is done is because I would argue Puerto Ricans are US citizens. And even though we don't have representation in the federal government, we still have an increasingly larger um, Latina, Latinx demographic. And we also have Puerto Rican politicians that through, through them, that they're not supposed to be representing us, but through them, there's a kind of pressure that was put um, on the US government for them, President George Bush, Donald W. Bush to say, you know, the Navy has to go. So that intense um, civil disobedience, that intense protesting, unrelentless, saying no, 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 no. That sort of transnational community of solidarity to get the Navy out really worked. And that being you sec even second class US citizens, but sort of navigating the situation really worked. In the case of Okinawans, they don't have that. So they have actually Tokyo, Japan, mainland Japan that is supposed to look out for them, but it really doesn't, right? So the relationship is sort of similar to San Juan and Vieques. So Tokyo ends up just basically being the visible um, presence that stops protesters, that quells dissent, that if people try to do civil disobedience, it's the Japanese government who actually takes care of them. In the case of Vieques, Vieques were very much about forcing the US um, um, armed forces to say, if you don't want us, then you have to deal with us, right? And you're gonna have to deal with our bodies doing the civil disobedience. In the case of Okinawa, that's not the case. And I think also that they have had more difficulty in getting people within the US domestic space to care to voice opposition and to say that this is not okay. And they need that solidarity, they need that support to be able to put the pressure on the US government to say that they can't do what they want to do with Okinawa. And maybe the last thing that I would say, thinking about linking colonial spaces and people of color, color through the US empire is that part of the pressure that Okinawans have put on Tokyo and on the US government has been to get the US government to agree to a reduction in the military presence but then what the US plans has planned to do is basically take people to Guam. So how is that fixing the situation, right? That's just giving the, making the problem, taking the problem from this island of 
colonial people of color, colonized for people of color, and then taking it to another. So maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah, Marie, jumping in a bit, uh, I, I, Avi may be sharing a few images in a moment from actual protests in, in Okinawa, but I wanted to ask you uh, a question, picking up on the theme of resistance. You know, what are lessons that uh, the people and organizers in Vieques uh, might have uh, for broader social justice activists in the United States, in the, in, in the continental United States or, uh, or other? I mean, uh, and, and, and I guess related to that, how so have the recent mass protests across the continental United States kind of uh, ec been echoed or, or, you know, I'm curious how those have resonated or what the discourse to your, to your knowledge has been within, uh, you know, Vieques or Puerto Rican activist, uh, you know, anti-militarist, uh, you know, anti-violence communities and, and organizations there. How, how has, have these, you know, these moments and these uh, movements, how, uh, have they been resonating with each other? And maybe how could they? What, what do you, what do you, what do you uh, know from your work on Vieques that you think might be, obviously politics is always local, but what might be transportable uh, that, that we're not aware of, uh, many of us? I think you're muted, Marie. I'll back it up. Okay, so I agree that politics is always local, but it's also very much transnational. Um, I would say that one of the most important things, I mean, Vieques people did civil disobedience intensely in the 1970s and in the 1980s. And they communicated with people in the mainland, in the US mainland through letters, through phone calls that were at that time quite expensive and people weren't able to, you know, talk much on the phone, but they coordinated. But something that was very different in 1999 to 2003 were things like social media and the internet. Um, being able to coordinate um, protest things, uh, communities of solid communities and solidarity across different spaces, putting pressure with civil disobedience in Washington, in New York, across the U.S., outside the U.S., in Puerto Rico, in Vieques, I think that was crucial. And also this technology allowed people to communicate with, again, other communities of color that were suffering the same fate at the hand of U.S. imperialism. Like, again, communicating with people in Okinawa, in South Korea, in Guam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, if you hear people talking, sharing actual strategies about what to do, about things like, seems rather simple, but uh, at some point, pe people in Vegas were cutting the cyclone fence to be able to cross into the bases and then sort of hide and made it difficult for you know, the bombing to continue. And eventually the US um, Navy put some sensors and they, they learned that if you put a lot of people and shake the fence, it's a way to disrupt the sensors. And that sort of knowledge about disrupting um, the workings of you know, the Navy are things that travel across activist circles across to the Atlantic, for example. Um, the other thing that I was gonna say is in terms of what I think is important to emphasize that of what worked in Vieques that could be recuperated is the need for allies, definitely. For allies that listen to the communities involved, but allies that are willing to speak up. And I would also say that absolutely central to the victory in Vieques was just civil disobedience that goes, a kind of protest that goes just beyond, you know, we're marching and we're chanting and we're saying, this is not enough, this is not good, we need to change, da, da, da. but I think, to me, peaceful, direct action that impedes the status quo functioning as it is, is absolutely necessary. Vieques would not have the, maybe would have never left Vieques if people would not have risked their lives going into the bombing um, range and saying no, no. And then people were arrested, trucks with people taken out, more people coming in. And I think that was absolutely necessary. And it is dangerous and it is scary and people suffer the consequences. Many people spent, you know, a year in jail or more but I don't think it would have worked without that, without sort of, again, peaceful protests that just disrupts the functioning of the status quo. Yeah, that's powerfully put. I think, I mean, those, those crystallized images of the, what the resistance has really looked like and what it has taken to really make a difference in impeding such a powerful force as the U.S. Navy. Um, it's a, a 
powerful reminder. Avi, you had a follow-up question. Um, no, it wasn't exactly a question. It was a comment. Um, because you asked me earlier about um, the anti-racist movements and what I thought some of the, um, or I was answering what I thought some of the potential um, for co-optation was. Um, and just listening to Marie speak right now, I was thinking about how important the question of colonialism is when we talk about race and how usually ignored it is. So that, again, I think of how my students in general come um, in thinking about race, that it's all about the color of your skin and um, not seeing it as part of a historic global system of, um, of colonization and the creation of white supremacy through a global colonial system, rather than just white people thinking well of themselves, <laughs> that uh, it's not just, racism is not just something that happens in people's minds. It gr what happens in people's minds grows out of these uh, colonial systems and structures. So, I mean, I think Marie was referring to that, but I just wanted to connect it back to, to my partially formulated answer to your earlier question. Uh, thanks for that, Avi. I think that these are really, I think a number of important nodes are emerging here, right? I mean, obviously we are brought together today on the show to, because of the most spectacular, the memory and the commemoration of some of the most spectacular, horrific violence in the history of humanity. But we're also, I think Marie and others have pulled us to also the need to think about the more sophisticated and sometimes off the radar, less perhaps overtly spectacular levels of violence that sustain imperialism and the oppressive and exploitative relationships, right, um, that, that imperialism thrives on and reproduces. Uh, I mean, I, I, we, I hope we will continue to deepen the discussion of resistance, but I do want to uh, draw us back a bit to uh, the, uh, the analysis and the historical analysis that, uh, that Gar and Joseph have, have started to unfold for us. Um, we actually had a question. It is now past the hour mark, and, and so I would I would like to welcome uh, to ask a question along these lines. Uh, his own question. Uh, we have another Joe with us today. Uh, this this one, a Joe Joe Nevins, who is also a scholar and activist on these issues of of, of imperialism. Uh, Joe Nevins, are you there? I'm there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you, okay. and uh, I hope we can. Can we see you too, or just hearing you? You just uh, see me. I just hear me. Just hear you. Uh, Joseph, uh, I think you had a question for for Gar. For, for Gar. Uh, would you would you relay it, please? Well, it's it's for everyone, but it builds off of Gar's point. And first of all, I want to I want to I want to thank Gar and Avi, and Joseph and Marie for sharing their analyses with us and for all their work. It's really inspiring stuff uh, over a long period of time. But you know, as I was, you know, I'm in my mid fifties, so I'm old enough to remember a time when disarmament um, and talk of it and, you know, and attempts to realize it were serious. And I was reminded of that when, you know, Ga made the point that we need to think about the present and the future and thinking about, you know, the 75th anniversary. And he spoke about, uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm misquoting you, Ga, please let me know, radical disarmament. In that regard, I'm wondering what can we learn from efforts elsewhere, you know, particularly in the past, in terms of advancing a demilitarization and disarmament agenda in the United States today. Because, you know, what I was suggesting in, in, is that, um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, my experience growing up in the 70s and 80s is that it, what, one of the things that's so striking about today is how little one hears talk about disarmament and demilitarization, it, it, at least in terms of um, mainstream political discourse, but also as suggested you know, maybe by some a comment that Joe, uh, Joe the host said uh, made earlier. Uh, even among the left, right, it's, it's just not something that people talk about much. And so, what can we learn from the past in terms of trying to change that? So, a powerful question. Maybe we can go to Gar first, and then and Joseph, you could step into that too if if you want. I know. Uh, I'm sure everyone on this, and, and then of course back to Avi and, and Marie as well. A, a very rich question, Gar. Well, I, I think this is really a critical question because, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of the ideologies that grew out of the corporate vision of American imperialism are very, very much the framework into which nuclear weapons fell. Uh, they didn't use the word imperialism, but they wanted to s control the world in a way that the corporate capitalist system, which they believe genuinely would be a stable system. They've gone through two world wars and Great Depression. 
And the, there was an ideological problem as well as an empire problem. And they were going to stabilize the world. And the bomb was in service of this larger uh, vision of William Appleman Williams, the great historian, has shown how capitalism and ideology work together to give the root. I think one of the answers was given, uh, Marie opened one answer, which is uh, what, the, what, what happened in Puerto Rico is that the Navy was displaced, that they were moved out, the bases were moved out in some way. But it's been a long time since there's been, uh, and one of the reasons to talk about it on, on this particular day, the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima, is that the nuclear issue has disappeared from activism except for very small numbers of people. And the linking that to the larger issues, I think, is really important and to, to open it up again in a, in a way that links to the questions of imperialism, to the questions of climate change. If one of these goes off, we will see real climate change, which will destroy millions of people's food sources because the clouds, will, the sky will be filled with massive debris if, if we have any of that. We haven't, and I think it's a really good question, how we bring back this gigantic question of nuclear weapons, which is staring us in the face. We're going into a $1.7 trillion expansion of nuclear weapons. That's the budget, the Obama administration at 1.4 trillion, we're now going into 1.7 trillion dollar in modernization. We've been extremely lucky so far. The question is, how do we link this to the anti-imperial questions? How do we build it in terms of the changing the, the democratic socialist questions? This has been out of out of out of sync, and it's, it's lost in most parts of the world. So uh, I myself uh, must must admit that I have not taken seriously how do we get serious about activism on this front and begin in linking it to all of the other important struggles. But I do think it's time for us to pose that question sharply. Uh, the Okinawa story is another one where there's a push to get the imperial forces off and the military out. How do we bring that back into the nuclear question and link that to the nuclear question? It, they simply, it has largely disappeared. There once was a serious uh, attempt at, at disarmament and climate change were linked in the atmospherics of, of testing was part of it. Uh, I, I'm, I, uh, I confess that I have not, not myself taken the activist role I used to take on these issues and beginning to think we have been extremely, extremely lucky. We've avoided it all, the nuclear weapon question. One of these days, these are going to go off and they are extraordinarily much, 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 much more powerful, much more dangerous than anything like the small small token bomb that was used in Hiroshima. So I'll, I'll jump in uh, and thank you, Gore. I was involved actually in helping to launch the freeze movement in 1979 and 80. Uh, and that was a period of great fear. I mean, the reality was, it, especially with, uh, with, with Reagan and his team's rhetoric, the idea that with enough shovels, we could uh, win a nuclear war. Uh, people were afraid uh, and, and we came up with a very uh, easy and it was perceived to be a fair frame of reference, you know, halt the nuclear arms race that people could mobilize around using traditional democratic means, uh, particularly the, the town meeting votes and, and referendum. And I think what happened uh, was that with the uh, end of the Cold War, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, people felt like, okay, the, the, the danger is gone uh, and you know, go back to normal life or you know, in, in the 90s, people were dealing principally with, with economic globalization issues. I mean, on the, on the financial dimension and making the links, the reality is that we're not going to build back better uh, in, on the other side of this pandemic uh, while we're spending essentially $2 trillion on nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, with this, the suffering that's going on is largely because of the military budget and, and, and really the misplaced priorities in this country. So I think we need to name that. The other thing I want to talk about here in terms of making the links, and I think this has been a problem, frankly, on the left and even in the peace movement, is a, sort of a, a division of two wings where you have the anti-imperialist, uh, anti anti-intervention uh, wing of the movement uh, and the nuclear disarmament movement. Uh, not understanding uh, that we're, we're dealing with, 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 with the, same, the same issue here. I mean, the reality is, I, I'm sorry I missed Gar before, uh, but the, the, um, uh, you know, the determinative reason for dropping the A-bomb uh, was to bring the war to an immediate halt so the U.S. could uh, not have to share influence with with the Soviet Union in northern China, Manchuria, uh, and, uh, and and in Korea, and you know I worked a bit with with Dan Ellsberg 
beginning in, in 82, um, earlier, but especially in 82. And what Dan teaches is that the United States during international crises and, and wars has repeatedly used its, its nuclear arsenal uh, in the same way that an armed robber uh, uses his gun in the middle of a, of a holdup. Whether or not the trigger is pulled, the gun has been used. And so what you have is the United States has made preparations and or threats to initiate nuclear war at least 30 times since Nagasaki, beginning as early as 1946 when Truman threatened war uh, over Iran. Uh, you know, the reason North Korea has nuclear weapons is because we threatened nuclear attack against Korea somewhere between nine and a dozen times. Uh, China, Vietnam, uh, the Middle East repeatedly. Uh, and to understand that there's a quotation from Secretary of, of, uh, of Defense Brown during the, the Carter administration, in which he says, with our, with our, nuclear, our nuclear weapons make our conventional forces meaningful instruments of, of diplomacy and, of, of, and for our conventional weapons. Noam Chomsky translated that into saying that you know, with our, our nuclear weapons, we have an umbrella that, that makes it essentially impossible for uh, other countries to come to defend those that we're, we're, we're intent on invading. So we need to understand nuclear weapons as imperial, as imperial weapons. And you know, the, the madness of it is that as we make these threats, uh, others will respond. This is what drives nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, so as the United States is now trying to regain nuclear primacy, uh, replacing its entire triad, uh, moving to deploy usable battlefield weapons in, in, in Europe. Uh, well, guess what? The Chinese are saying, maybe we don't have enough nuclear weapons to maintain a deterrent force. Maybe we should build, build some more. You know, I, I don't know that this will do the trick, uh, but on Sunday uh, uh, in Europe, uh, a number of major forces are going to be announcing a campaign to block the deployment of these battlefield nuclear weapons, the B-6112, which can be dialed down uh, as, a, as a battlefield weapon low yield or up to be a strategic nuclear weapon. They're to be deployed in, in five European nations. You have the International Peace Bureau, the International Trade Union Confederation with 200 million members worldwide, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament in Britain, uh, Mouvement de la Paix in France and other organizations. You know, the movement that we had in, 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 the, in, in, in 79 in the early 80s, in many ways was a response to the movement in Europe because with the US and the Soviet buildups, Europe was seen, understood themselves as the target for that nuclear war. They began massive demonstrations, millions of people in, in the street and you know, being a bit sen you know, appropriately sensitive, uh, our movement responded. And I can hope that on the one hand, our movement will respond to what's happening in Europe and on the other hand, our movement has got to understand what's going on in Asia and the Pacific uh, and the increasing arms race, uh, dangerous confrontations with China. And I'll just close by saying that some of us are beginning to work, it's not so much movement work, but it's conceptual work uh, around the idea of common security. Uh, we need to understand that, uh, and I mean, the Palma, the Palma Commission uh, really played a major role in creating a framework for the end of the of the nuclear arms race, leading to the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty, uh, and you know basically the idea that one nation can't be secure uh, if it's making its rivals insecure. You get to a spiraling arm, arms race. So you've got to do that hard-headed diplomatic negotiations of what's going to make each side safe. The idea that security comes uh, from with and, and not against, um, and we need to begin talking about that uh, in, in this country. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Uh, I mean, so many important points here made up different potential ways Gar and Joseph have, have not just potential, but actual, but things that need to be developed more in terms of these linkages, the linkages, just the immense amounts of resources being wasted on these nuclear weapons, uh, the ecological impacts, you know, the, the racial and imperial aspects of how they've been used and whose lives matter uh, when, when calculations about bombing are made at the highest levels. Maria, uh, Marie, you have... Um, already touched on this, I think, in a very powerful way, and I wanted to ask you to maybe step into it um, again, particularly with your, your provocative suggestion that the, the anti-police violence movement really, uh, to become universal, to become what we need, needs to become an anti-imperial or even an anti-militarist movement more broadly, uh, not limiting itself to, to what we think of often as police violence here in the United States. Do you have other thoughts? I'm sure you have other thoughts. I'd love to hear some of your other thoughts on the linkages 
that can be made that are there potentially, as well as the kind of linkage that you've seen uh, activists make already, again, that can be exemplary uh, for, for making particularly um, the anti-nuclear and anti-war movement, um, you know, re-inspired and reinvigorated as we may have seen a wane of it here in the United States. Um, well, there are many things that can be said about this that scholars, activists have been saying for so many years. Um, even particularly thinking about um, pro-Palestine activism, making the link of just how how intimate are is the violence of militaries, militaries across the world, the violence that militaries across the world wield, and then how that is so so much shared by the police within the US, right? And I would say that part of the issue here, and I think there's a way in which, this is a critique, activism within the US still has this sort of imperial mindset where people seem to think that there is a clear within, and therefore may focus on, well, our problem is really the, you know, the police, but then don't, don't see those linkages between the military and the police, right? that the same kinds of weapons, that the same, same kinds of tactics, that the, you know, the, the same kind of people are circulating within the police and the military. And therefore, I think that people in the US mistakenly separate the issue of the problem is the police and then there's the military. And as we can see, particularly thinking about, you know, what Donald Trump has done recently, again, it's all, muddled and confused and where does the police end, where does the military begin is unclear, right? And what, who's supposed to be dealing with what sort of situation is again unclear. Um, so I think that, that to me that's an issue. Sort of the activism within still sort of having this imperial mindset, this sort of comfort that there's a clear border, that this is the within, that this is the police and then not having an analysis of the without and of empire and not even using empire as a word that people are comfortable using within the U.S. I mean, outside the U.S., of course, you know, people use it all the time. The other thing that I would say, besides this sort of critique of, you know, the comfort of the domestic and the foreign, and therefore the difference between the police and, and the military, is that um, I think that issue is colonialism, is racism, is capitalism, is also just outright sexism and toxic masculinities that have to be thought about when we're talking about this kind of violence and about militarization and you know the violence of the military and the police. And um, when we're thinking about sort of hegemonic popular conceptions of what is protection, what is security, it's usually a very masculinist sort of like, well, the world is a hostile place and there are you know us and others and therefore those us hostile others need to be dealt with just raw violence, right? To at least stop them. And I think that there needs to be a radical anti-colonial feminist pol uh, politics, a politics of, of, you know, of radical love that does away with the idea that there are others out there that are not like me, racialized, colonial, whatever, savage others, and that we humanize those others, that we don't think that therefore they deserve to be on the subjected to the kind of violence that the U.S. empire, you know, subjects people to. And I think that toxic masculinities and sexism within the U.S. don't allow for this radical politics of love to take hold. It just sort of reduces to the sort of like corny, like female thing, right? That it's not rational. It's like people are hostile. People are not necessarily hostile. It's just a way of thinking that furthers this kind of violence and furthers U.S. empire. Maria, I think that's so powerful how you put it. I mean, the, the need for a, a politics of radical love that doesn't accept the very idea that there is some other, right, that doesn't deserve the same respect or treatment or dignity or rights that we or whoever, whoever's, whoever's the subject does, the, the us them distinction. That's just so powerfully put. And I think in its implications really uh, just could have just really radically positive implications if people can take up such an ethic here. Uh, Avi, we wanted to ask you to st step into this too, to talk more about 
uh, some of these issues that have been raised. And also, I think we have the images that you were yes. promising to share of some actually existing physical resistance that we can uh, we can take a look at as we as we listen to some of your thoughts. So, Avi. Okay, so Surin, I hope you can get the images up. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, I think, pick up right where Marie left off and talk about this issue of militarism and security and what we conceptualize as security, what we're taught to think of as security, which means not security, but dominance. Um, and it was really, I didn't send you that picture, did I? Didn't mean to. Yeah, that's the one I sent. Um, this is one of the protests out, uh, outside of where they're trying to build a new base. Um, they're trying, uh, there's been so much protest about one of the largest bases in Okinawa that is like right in the middle of a major city. Um, so the United States got this bright idea to uh, build a base by filling in a piece of the ocean um, in the northern part of the island. And um, there's, there's a sort of a tent city outside the base. And uh, this, this is one of the sites of, of most protests today is to stop the building of the Henneco base. So you can just go through all four um, photos if you want. Um, so, but what's the, so this, this idea of security um, and this is in what uh, a national forest in the north of the country where there's a US training ca camp. This is uh, again a tent city outside the training camp and the last photo is the security guards guarding the entrance of the camp. And this especially reminded me of um, it was something I had never seen anywhere in Japan during my uh, many months that I've spent there. Um, this kind of security. Uh, I've only seen things like this in Colombia. Uh, at the entrance to the uh, multinational coal mine that um, was supplying coal to Massachusetts for uh, many decades. Yeah, that is Hideki. Um, uh, he, he was my tour guide there of the protests. Uh, that, that there's a political economy to this militarism and to this definition of security. It means everything belongs to us. Um, and I think it goes with the attitude of toxic masculinity that Marie was talking about. Um, and the sense of the United States as the global policeman, but that there's a political economy to that too. It is about, we want everything and everything should be ours. Um, and uh, just linking it back to the coal mine. Oh, okay. So uh, the United States made sure that, um, that military actions, uh, that the, um, uh, emissions of military action, of U.S. military actions aren't going to be counted in towards U.S. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions when we report them to the, uh, to the international community. Um, even without that, though, our emissions are so outsized, our, uh, our per capita emissions are light years ahead of anyone else's in the world because we take everyone's resources and we consume everyone's resources. And that's what this military violence is about. And um, so I just wanted to sort of bring in the polit political economy of this too, as you look at the pictures of the sort of grassroots um, protests. But the other thing is both in Okinawa and Colombia, which is the places where I've been um, most closely present at some of these protests is it's very clear to people there what's going on and without any resources they're organizing protests against it and one of the most frustrating things here is when we hear people say um, well the problem is so big we can't do anything about it we don't know what to do somehow poor people in the third world figure out what to do uh, it's just us with all our resources here that can't figure out what to do Avi, so following that, what do you say needs to be done in light of this kind of gap, right, between the discourse here within the United States and the and the and the and the not just discourse, but the actions that you are you are so aware of abroad? How, how do we bridge that gap, or what? What you know is it pre precisely? I guess listening to what's being done and helping to amplify and learn from these these actions that are the people that are leading the way abroad. Um, how do we bridge this gap? Well, we could be doing those kinds of things here too. If we, one, knew about what was going on and two, cared about what was going on. So I guess I feel like my job as a professor is to help people know 
learn about what's going on and to make them care about it. Um, but once you have those two things, uh, you know, you go out in the streets, you have general strikes, you uh, put up tent cities, you refuse, you, uh, um, again, it's not that hard to figure out what to do. What's hard is to care enough to want to do something. I think that's our problem. Not that, not, it's not just our lack of imagination, but it's our lack of caring. Like we live pretty well here. I want to go back to Gar and, and Joseph on some of these issues that have been raised here. But I also want to point out, I, reading that recent book, How to Hide an Empire, uh, right, by Daniel Imrevoir, Imrevoir really, I mean, I, I found it very distur I mean, disturbing and eye-opening, but also it gave me a kind of hope in, in the following way. Even as someone who has been involved in social justice, anti-war, anti-imperialist movements for so long, there were just so many facts about the basic infrastructure of U.S. imperialism, past and present, that I just wasn't even aware of. I mean, really just brutal facts about, you know, like, you know, massacres here and there, but I mean, but also just like these everyday infrastructure of like, of these bases. And it gave me hope that if, because some of the facts are so hidden and so glaring, that in fact, to the degree we can really bring out some of these facts, maybe the problem, at least in some communities, is not that people don't care, but people really don't know, you know, at least it gives me some, some hope of that, that we can light a fire under people and, and have a new a new wave of a kind of uh, broad and mainstream anti-imperialist movement. Um, it made me feel like an optimist just to know that I had actually had so many things hidden from me for so long, despite being in the, in the business of uncovering them, uh, to turn pessimism into optimism there. But, uh, you know, Gar and Joseph, we had a couple questions that I think um, head in your direction. One, I was asked to relay from a, 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 a participant who doesn't want to speak. And then one, I want to call on Bruce Simon, a regular on our program, a regular participant, always has a good question or two up his sleeve. Uh, the first question, which I, uh, I had in front of me a moment ago, came from Mary. And it was about the question of US military brass and their, their resistance. I think this is kind of maybe for you, Gar, um, in terms of US military higher ups, being opposed to the bombing and speaking out publicly opposed to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atom bomb. But clearly, as Mary indicated in her question statement, they didn't, there was a great deal of bombing before the nuclear bombs were, were dropped in terms of the firebombing of Dresden, the firebombing of, of Tokyo. And so I wanted to ask you to step into this question, I mean, addressing uh, Mary's point about, you know, what, how do you, what is your an analysis of the military uh, brass here i mean why you know why did they oppose the bomb the, the atomic bomb but not the 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 non-nuclear fire bombing of of tokyo uh, and i'd actually like to add on to that question if i could what is your read on the potential for discon you know discontent division within the military um past and present i mean i, I couldn't help as you were talking earlier think about you know trump's attempt to call out the military on recent non-violent protests and the way in which he got some of what he asked for, but a lot of what he was asking for he didn't get, you know, raising a question about the military's uh, willingness to use certain kinds of force, at least here in the United States, openly. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts both on the distinction within, you know, between the non-nuclear bombing and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the nuclear weapons within, from the military standpoint, but also on this broader question of the potential or the lack thereof for discontent and resistance or division within the military apparatus itself, particularly in this kind of Trump era that we're in. Uh, so that one's for Gar, and then we'll go to you, Bruce. Those are uh, obviously the, some of the central questions. Uh, look, going back to the 1945 period, there is a strain, we often think of, I was, I was a student of William Appleman Williams, the great left Marxist theorist of, of really imperialism, but also of ideology. And within a certain part of the traditional conservative culture, I'm not talking about the current primarily free enterprise, take what you can get conservative culture, there was a vision of morality. And it was a conservative vision, it was not mine, but they didn't believe about killing people for nothing. And so all these military guys, it's, it's a remarkable to read their statements. They come out saying the war was over, we should have stopped killing people. And it, they were outraged by the use of the atomic bomb in Japan. This is quite remarkable, but an important insight into ideology and also conservative ideology of the better, earlier, less, less uh, insane 
versions we see often now. So I just want to put that piece on the table uh, as kind of trying to understand that. The, and I think some of them are resisting Trump today. They don't like what they see in Trump. They, they want to have their guns and they want to have their bombs, but they don't like Trump and they, 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 work, they think of themselves as defending uh, American liberty and democracy. Uh, they don't use the word empire and they don't use the word capitalism, but they have this kind of vision of themselves, which is what it is, but it's not the same as Trump's. The other piece is, and I want to go back to something that the culture of, uh, the culture of violence or acceptance of violence or also insecurity in this country, which breeds a sense somebody's going to get you and you've got to defend and violent within the capitalist marketplace, which is a very, very nasty substructure in our culture that allows all this buildup and sees the world as they're going to get you, I'm insecure. I think that's a critical part of it. I spend most of my time these days working on what's called a new economy, which are building community structures and trying to socialize enterprise at the local level and trying to rebuild a whole vision of what a democratic socialist society would look like as part and parcel of my reaction to Hiroshima. That unless you actually dig deeper and think about reconstructing a, a, the rebuilding of community at the local level around community ownership, with a lot of very interesting experiments that are not known to everybody are going on around the world that are very sophisticated, some of them involving hundreds and hundreds of people in community and worker ownership, rebuilding a culture that is not capitalist, but under changing the underpinning in the culture of the militarism as well as part of, I, I, I came from studying Hiroshima, but I think you have to drive it back to both anti-imperialism of the kind that moves things out, but also taking seriously, how do you change, really change the system and rebuild a, a different culture and a different political economy to support that culture? I think you've got to walk on two legs. And I think we've neglected the, the need to actually take on, there's a democratic socialist movement, but it often is, speaks in, in the terms of social democracy, which is kind of capitalism plus the welfare state, rather than a much deeper reconstruction of the, of the system, uh, which I, and there's a lot of good experiments, which we had time, if we had time to talk about. It. There's a huge amount going on in this country and, and in England and in Norway and, and Denmark in the reconstruction of a different sense of what the, a, a democratic socialist a community build, built the economy looks like. And that's a whole other subject we could go into, but an uh, enormous amount going on. This doesn't get a lot of press. Gar, we would love to have you back on the show to really dive into that. I know you've done so much work on that front as well as this this work, uh, you know, on on the, the issue of the bomb and and coming uh, out of weapons. Hiroshima for me. Yeah, no, and I think that's a profound point. Really, profound yeah. point that we need to address these things in a holistic way, and that I mean that I, I love that line that that Marie made about the radical love, but the, 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 what would the expression of radical love wouldn't only be opposing violence, but would also be redistributing resources and, and changing the very way in which we relate to life and society in general. That, so people perhaps wouldn't feel so insecure that they would join the military in the first place as the only job opportunity, that they wouldn't feel so insecure that they would, they would even be tempted to think violence might be an adequate uh, or a, a just response to some of these situations where it's clearly not. So uh, consider that an invitation, Gar. We would love to continue that uh, conversation uh, with you. I understand that Avi may need to leave us momentarily, so I wanted to give her a chance to either offer a, a parting uh, word of wisdom or just a, a plain out goodbye. Avi, it's been great to have you with us today. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say it's really been an honor to be here with everybody. and. Um, it's very inspiring to hear about the different work that people are doing in their different areas and um, and feel part of something bigger when I spend most of my days just sitting and writing and not uh, hearing about what anybody else is doing. So um, thank you all for coming in at the last minute like this. It's really great to have you all together. Yeah, it really is. And Avi, you helped to make it happen, really. I don't know if we would have had a show. We might have taken our first week off if you hadn't shown your uh, chops as not just a, a scholar, but an organizer. Uh, so again, thanks to you and have a, have a great night. Um, Thank you. So yeah, uh, Bruce Simon ha has been in the queue for a while when has a question or two. I know he's been, he shared in the chat box here, but for those who cannot read the chat box, he'll have to say it out loud. So Bruce, unmute and, and lay it on us. Sure. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for a very moving show. Uh, my my brother-in-law is Okinawan, and uh, two of my 
girl's cousins are are part Okinawan. Um, and I, I spent a Fulbright in Japan uh, back during the occupation of Ar Ar Iraq and um, uh, visited Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki uh, museums. So thanks for just shifting topics. Um, I'm disappointed that I didn't get to see Greg, but, but I do appreciate um, this topic a great deal. We'll have him back. We'll have him back. So yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. Excellent. So the first question is, is tied to the firebombing question. I mean, when you read John Dower's work on the war in the Pacific and the overt racism and, 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 and the violence, you know, on, on both sides against each other, um, uh, but, you know, particularly from the U.S. side, it, it, it really challenges the idea of the greatest generation and the, the you know, World War II as, as the good war. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, do we need to, you know, kind of call more attention to potential war crimes of the U.S., to human rights abuses, to the fact that Japan is still paying the U.S. money now um, to, to host these bases, right? Um, you know, this seems like, a, you know, uh, from my wife's point of view, a completely unjust situation. And I just was wondering if, if either person wanted to comment, if anyone wanted to comment on that. Thanks, Bruce. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and, and say, I think what's just really critically important is, is bringing people's stories forward. Uh, you know, the analysis is, is good, but people respond to, you know, to human stories. Uh, you know, in the, in the past, and with the pandemic, it's hard, but in the past, we, you know, we've done any number of speaking tours, but this can be done as well now by, by Zoom, uh, so that, that people can bring their stories, you know, whether it's, it's from Okinawa, you know, you know, it's not only, look, I mean, the United States has an Air Force base in the middle of Tokyo, in the middle of the national capital, um, uh, you know, so any number of ways, and, you know, it's a global thing. I want to, I want to jump back, if you will, to, to another dimension that I think we're going to have to face, uh, which is, is the danger that we're, we're not going to have uh, either a fair election or maybe even uh, the, the winner of an election uh, achieving office. I have no particular love for Biden, but you know, my sense is that if, if, if Trump holds on, you know, we can kiss what we've considered constitutional democracy pretty much goodbye. Uh, and so I think our movement has got to engage on that. And then jumping in a related way to, to a, a question about the role of the military. Uh, you know, one of the, you know, I've, I've been working a little bit in, in my mind with, with the model of the Etza revolution, uh, where in, in the Philippines in Marcos's last days, uh, you know, people turned out in, you know, hundreds of thousands to, to try to bring down the dictator. Uh, and it wasn't until the Philippine military switched with a bit of a push from Washington uh, that, uh, that, 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 that Marcos had to flee. And you know, we had at least a democratic moment uh, in, in the Philippines. So I've been wondering about you know, what might happen if millions of people go into the streets uh, you know, after election day or uh, you know, up, until, up until inauguration day. And we had a webinar the other night, uh, again, with, with Lawrence Wilkerson. Uh, who, you know, you don't get a whole lot, he may only be a colonel, but you don't get a whole lot higher in the military uh, than being the chief of staff to the um, Secretary of Defense. And what was interesting was he, he said that the, the military is unlikely to act against, uh, say, other, other branches of the military, special forces or, or National Guard. And in terms of coming out onto the streets, he was talking about the number of people within the military who vote Republican, uh, the number of people who uh, in, in, in the military who identify with Trump. So I think we've got to do some very serious thinking in a very short period of time uh, about how we are going to respond to uh, the loss of what we've experienced as, um, as, as constitutional, if imperial, uh, democracy. Uh, because if, 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 that, if we move into something like a, a more formal dictatorship, it's going to be a whole lot harder to do the work we've been talking about tonight. Joseph, um, thank you for raising that connection to the election, which is a theme we will continue to return to in our shows uh, leading in towards November. We actually, last week, we had a, a show on uh, democracy, the election, and the left. And I would like to highly recommend, I thought it was a, a really rich, dynamic, thought-provoking discussion. Victor Wallace, who's actually on the Zoom now, more in the listening mode, was, was uh, helped to lead that discussion, as did 
Medea Benjamin, the well-known activist and co-founder of Code Pink, talking about how, what, what is a left, you know, what should be the left's relationship to this election. And, and uh, I, thought, I think many people would, would appreciate that. I think that the link has been shared in the chat box. Um, Marie, I'd like to welcome you uh, to, to step into some of these issues that have been raised here. Uh, every time you speak, I just want to listen more. In fact, I want to extend to you an invitation as we do start to draw near uh, the end of our allotted time to come back onto Shelter and Solidarity. We'd like to do, I was conferring with some producers here on the side, and uh, we would really like to have you back to help anchor a show specifically on uh, imperialism and, and the struggle in Puerto Rico. Uh, to see if, if you would, uh, you know, not to put you on the spot or anything, but the invitation is there if you seek to uh, respond to it. But there's a lot to respond to here as we move towards maybe wrapping up. And I, in fact, would love everyone to offer maybe a closing uh, comment before we do finally wrap up in a few minutes. But Marie, what, what would you like to say? Uh, I don't have so much a question for you as, as I have an invitation to, to just step into what's on the table. Maybe to, to wrap up, not that it can be, this, this is obviously a, a, a theme that, a topic that should be discussed more, much more, um, as we've been talking about. Maybe I would say this. Um, I think that in a very basic sense, it's important to think about that violence once you put it out there you can't control it, it flows, right? So whatever we think we may be doing by you know, using the military in any sort of way, using the police in any sort of way, once violence is out there, it flows and you can't control, you really can't control. And it travels and it keeps on manifesting in different ways. And I think in a similar way, uh, in terms of weapons, once you have it, once you use it, the effects are there. You can't really take it back. And I want to make this point in the case of thinking of places like Vieques, right? Vieques is an incredibly beautiful island that cannot, it's still beautiful, but it cannot go back to what it was before the Navy did what it did for 60 years. I just want to make the point that the military, the U.S. military, and the military is across the world, but particularly the U.S. military just goes and destroys. And whatever it destroys, it's forever impacted. The landscapes cannot be, you know, turned back to what they were, right? So then we have to deal with this. This sort of destruction that you just can't do like this. You can't, like, you can't throw millions at it and make it what it was. It doesn't go back to what it was. People don't go back to what they were, who they were. So it's a permanent damage that is out there. So I think therefore the responsibility is on us to not let that violence be manifested in, this, in the first place, to stop it. Yeah, that's a crucial reminder, uh, Marie. Uh, uh, Marie. Um, we live in a culture that makes things, makes it seem like things can disappear, you know, whether it's, you know, throwing away trash after, you know, uh, it, we, it disappears from our, you know, as if there is an outside somewhere where things can be flushed. Right, but certainly, I mean, military, the actual violence, as well as even the toxicity wrapped up with nuclear weapons and, and massive we military weapons itself, right? This stuff doesn't leave the earth, right? Just because even when it stops, um, you know, I suppose when a war stops, it still remains there as potential violence, as trauma, and as actual toxic waste seeping into our environment, even if it isn't actually exploded, right? As we've been reminded with this explosion in Beirut, which I mean, we're still trying to learn the, you know, the details of, but I mean, certain kinds of toxic stuff left lying around is always a danger to humanity, right? Even, even if it's not intentionally exploded, um, you know, just to tie it into the headlines of the last couple of days. Yeah, Marie. Can I say one more thing about just even simple thinking about money? Like there's the budget for the military that takes all sorts of forms and is, you know, hidden in all sorts of ways. But part of what is many times not talked about is that when the U.S. military does what it does within U.S. soil, then there comes in the super fund. And who's paying again for all of this? It's us. There's the destruction, and then there's supposed to be sort of the repairing of the destruction. And it's still our money. 
right? That we're supporting this sort of violence, this building of violence, this destruction of humanity and landscapes, humans and non-humans, and we pay for this, the destruction and the repairing of this. And of course, again, a repairing that never really repairs. Yeah, it's, I mean, the potential connections here between an environmental consciousness and an anti-militarist consciousness and anti-racist consciousness seem to be, and, and the movement, movement towards socialism and even social democracy, the, the connections are potentially quite so profound here. You know, will they manifest in the way that, that the human race needs them to in time to, to make a difference? Um, closing comments. I mean, we, we're, we're uh, getting close to two hours here, so we would like to move towards wrapping up. Um, Gar, you went, you spoke first, and then Joseph, maybe we can end in that same order, and then we'll, uh, we'll plug next week and wrap up this episode. Gar? Well, this has been a very, uh, very thoughtful discussion, and uh, appreciate being invited to participate. Uh, I, I really think that we've got, uh, the, the Chinese used to have a phrase, walk on two legs. I, I really do think that we've got to resist and hold back not only nuclear weapons, but militarism and imperialism. But we also need to rebuild a, a, an American democratic community because the culture of the community is supportive of the imperial and military structure. So there's a resistance and a re restraint side and then there's a positive rebuilding side. And I think we've got to really consider how to do both. And I think there is a movement working very intensely in many parts of the country, which is trying to build on the, on the positive side as well. Um, it is a very nasty conundrum of issues that we face and the dangers as well as the, there's some opportunity as well. Uh, so this is a very good discussion. I appreciate the being invited to, to participate. Thanks, Gar. It's been great having you a part of it. And uh, absolutely, if there was never ever a time that uh, people, you'd think you could get people amped up about the absolute misuse and abuse of resources, right? You'd think even in this United States of America, you would think that uh, the, the scarcity of the COVID crisis and the economic depression would, would make those trillion dollar figures that you all have mentioned even more uh, unacceptable or, or finally unacceptable to those who have maybe accepted them as part of the norm for for too long. Joseph? Well, I want to echo, I want to echo Gar in, in appreciating the invitation and, you know, Soren sort of reaching out to me kind of uh, late in the afternoon. Uh, I also want to say, on, on the one hand, I am very envious of Gar having studied under William Appen and Williams. You know, I've got a, a, a fair bit of my bookshelf filled with his books. Uh, and, and also just to say, you know, that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a privilege to be on a, on a, um, uh, on an event with Gar, who, who through his writings has been among my teachers, and so I, I just want to uh, appreciate him. And then, you know, many people on on this call, you know, are, are friends, people that I've been involved with uh, for years, and uh, it was a pleasure hearing, you know, from from Marie. And uh, I have memories of being in Vieques, and you know, can can, can picture the place as, as as you're as you're talking about it. Uh, my mind went to. Um, essentially two, two places in, in terms of, uh, of wrapping up. Um, both kind of rooted in, in, in the anniversary uh, today. Um, you know, among the things that Trump wants to do is to renew nuclear weapons testing. Uh, and uh, if he proceeds with that, it's not clear if that would be underground testing uh, in, in Nevada, uh, from which there is always venting. Uh, or whether it might be again in, in the Pacific and, and atmospheric. And we need to appreciate if that happens, we're going to have more people exposed to deadly radiation. And there's a lack of understanding here in the United States that there are perhaps as many as a million nuclear weapon victims among the US people. Um, people exposed to the, the, the fallout from radiation, uh, particularly Native Americans involved in the, in the mining, uh, and transport of, of, of uranium, uh, atomic, atomic veterans, not so many of them as they're getting older, but who were basically sacrificed uh, in preparations for, for, for war and for nuclear war. Uh, and, and as we're talking about, you know, the people who were sacrificed, as we're talking about people, you know, human stories, I think we need to, to hold, hold them uh, very much with us and, and to appreciate its impact here. The other thing is that, you know, I've had the really extraordinary uh, privilege of working with um, uh, leading uh, A-bomb survivors, people who have created the movement. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, a webinar on Sunday morning 
where I'll be focusing on two of them with, with, with photographs. Uh, and, you know, I, I had the experience, I had the privilege of working with people who'd been involved in the nonviolent resistance to Nazi occupations in, in Europe. And I took strength from them. But I've also taken really deep strength and spirit uh, from the courage of, of many of, of the Hibakusha. Uh, people who are, are, if you will, the last women and the last men on earth. Uh, tortured with the A-bombs, uh, forced to live in poverty, uh, lack of medical care, um, uh, you know, a U.S. imposed government where it was impossible to, to talk about what had happened for doctors and scientists to, to research it. And these people who came forward to be really the leading figures in the struggle for a nuclear weapons free world and, and for, for human survival. And, you know, there'll be other people besides the Hibakusha, from whom you, know, you have or will be able to take strength. But I, I think that for the, you know, for the struggles that we're in, for the commitments that we have, for the affirmation commitment to life that we have, it's important that we hold on onto this, onto this spirit. Uh, Nazim Hikmet, the, the, the Turkish poet, has a poem called On Living. Uh, and I encourage people to, he's the, 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 the poet laureate of, of, of Turkey, uh, take a look at that and uh, see if it doesn't match your spirit yet, uh, or, or if it doesn't, uh, make it your spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. And could you say the name of that uh, poem one more time so we can actually post it well, in the, the chat poem, box? The poem is titled On Living. On and, Living. And, and the poet is Nazim Hikmet, H-I-K-M-E-T. Yes. You can find it online. Yes, Hikmet's work is, is incredibly, with a, I believe with a, with a Z, his, his met, right? Uh, is is K M E T H I K M E T? Uh, yeah, uh, it, I was crossed up there. Um, incredibly powerful work, and we do do poetry on this show too. We do, and perhaps we I feel like we could have that poem read right now if we were ready. It's there in the chat box. Um, not sure how long it is, but perhaps uh, people can check it out. Thank you so much, Joseph Gar. Uh, Marie, Avi, uh, in absentia, although we still have a picture of her here on the Zoom. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your, your timely and, and profound contributions to this discussion, which I found both informative and inspiring in the ways that, that you've spoken. Um, I would like to thank also our, our team of producers here on Shelter and Solidarity, uh, which includes Seren Mudliar, Linda Liu, Tim Sheard, Kira Mudliar, and others who helped to make this show come on every week every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'd also like to thank our growing list of sponsoring organizations, which includes the journal uh, Socialism and Democracy, which is a, a research journal for activists that brings together the world of, of, uh, of political movement building and intellectual reflection. I'd like to also uh, mention Hardball Press, a publisher of Working Class Stories, which is a sponsor of the program, as well as E5 Encuentro Cinco, uh, a decades, more than a decade old hub of organizing in the and social justice movement building in the heart of downtown Boston. And I'd like proud to introduce our newest sponsor, Community Church of Boston, uh, that has come on board to help us uh, build on this work. And I, I see Dean Stevens is with us right now, quietly applauding. Well, welcome um, aboard and thank you for your support. We can only do this with your help. And, and we do welcome you. We're gonna wrap up shortly, but if you'd like to stick around for the debrief and offer your thoughts off camera when we're not recording, some of us will hang around. Otherwise, we hope to see you all next week, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we will have a back to school blues special on, on uh, next week, uh, that is August 13th, back to school blues and struggles as we bring in educators, parents, K-12 higher ed educators, students to talk about the struggles and concerns people face as uh, the school year looms. See you then. <laughs>